This is a famous poem by Robert Frost. In this podcast, I want to talk you through the poem. And in the next one, I'll talk to you more broadly about its themes and subtleties. Robert Frost was a much beloved poet of the first half of the 20th century. Actually, if we want to take a one minute side trip and consider the history of modern poetry in the early 20th century, let's say the first half of it, it was a time when a lot of poetry became pretty inaccessible to most people. Poets like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and others felt that the 20th century world was complex and inscrutable, and they felt poetry should reflect that, just as they felt modern life required great intellectual exertions to understand, so should poetry. Thus, much poetry of the first half of the 20th century was very difficult, with complicated syntax and obscure allusions. The result was that the average person turned away from poetry and it became pretty much a literary form that was pursued in colleges and universities. But of course, there are exceptions to everything and Robert Frost is an exception. He was born and raised in rural New England and he wasn't interested in writing difficult, obscure poetry. He wanted to write poetry that addressed important, universal themes, but that anybody could read and understand. Now he's considered to be one of America's great poets, and he was very popular when he was alive. But during his lifetime, he was not very highly thought of by the poetic establishment because his poems were so homey and uncomplicated. Mending Wall is a famous poem, but sometimes misinterpreted by grade school and high school teachers, I think. First, we need to visualize what kind of wall we're talking about here. The setting of this poem is New England. It's one of Robert Frost's early poems. It was published in 1914, a time before wood fences were common. So property lines were identified with stone walls or fences. We don't see those too much anymore, but there is one around here. As you're driving out of town toward Union City or Erie, you'll pass St. Catherine's Cemetery on the left. Around that cemetery, you'll see an old stone wall of the type that Frost is describing in this poem. Here are some pictures of it. You can see that all the stones are shaped differently. In some places, it seems like the merest gust of wind would topple them over. And in fact, these walls do suffer a lot of damage in harsh winters. The freezing and thawing of the ground, the high winds, heavy snows, caused the stones to fall over in places and make holes. In the spring, it's necessary to go out and mend the wall. And that's where the title of this poem comes from. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing, I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made, but at spring mending time, we find them there. Okay. The poet tells us in these opening lines that walls like this just won't stay intact. Weather destroys them. Rabbit hunters damage them as they and their dogs clamor over them in pursuit of their prey. Sometimes when the speaker comes to prepare the wall, he finds it completely torn down in places, not one stone on a stone. So mending this wall is a big job. It has to be done every spring, so the poet and his neighbor make a plan and do it together. 
I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. To each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game. One on a side, it comes to little more. Okay, now we come to the point in the poem when the sauce begins to thicken. So far, this has been a straightforward poem about describing the wall and mending it. But at this point in the poem, the speaker begins to consider why we do this. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. So the speaker questions the need for the wall and makes the very legitimate point that his apple trees aren't going to traipse across the field and bother his pine trees, and vice versa. But the neighbor, who seems to be a really simple guy, can't be convinced. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. But the speaker is determined to pursue the point, to try to engage the neighbor in debate. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. Well, that seems to be a pretty good argument. If there were cows, the speaker could see a reason for the wall. Cows do walk around, and they could get on the neighbor's property. But there are no cows, so why a wall? What in the world are you walling in or out? Walls are against nature, but the neighbor just keeps on mending the wall. The next lines sometimes confuse students a little. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. So the speaker is on the verge of being a little facetious with the neighbor here. I could say we were walling out elves. Of course not. There aren't any elves. Elves only exist in our imaginations, and that's the point. This wall's only purpose is to wall out imaginary intruders. But he doesn't even say it, figuring that this neighbor would miss the point. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage arm. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only, and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says it again. Good fences make good neighbors. So this image of the neighbor seems pretty ominous. He's undoubtedly a well-built, strapping guy because he's done hard outside work all his life. And when he stands with a stone in each hand, he reminds the speaker of an old stone savage armed. Not that he's violent or the speaker is afraid of him, but his mindset and attitudes strike the speaker as primitive. The lines, he moves in darkness as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees, suggests a metaphorical darkness, an unenlightened mind that is not able to think beyond the saying of his father. Good fences make good neighbors. Okay, 
Now that's a basic run through of the poem. In the next short podcast, I want to talk to you about what it means, the subject and theme.